the end of our series in Revelation. I just killed a cool looking bug. Revelation. Ooh, wow, he's stuck. Little tiny thing looks kind of like a fly, but man, does it stink. Stink bug? Are they tiny? They're tiny things? I do. It's a baby. Wow. Smells like moldy carrots or something. <laughs> yeah. I might be ADHD. Thank you. <laughs> Announce my text and talk about a bug. I'm talk about my shirt. Anthony did this to me. I was going to make up a story about Caleb and I getting together with some chocolate, you know, but uh, <laughs> I haven't been, I have not been, had a chance to go restock my pulpit with Hershey's chocolate kisses. And so I do want to publicly apologize to all the children in the room <laughs> this evening. I'm very sorry. And uh, if you would remind me more, I would be better about my oversight. And it isn't rude to remind pastors about candy. Uh, you know, if you were to ask other adults for things, you're not supposed, you know, your parents tell you, oh, you're not supposed to ask for things like that. But you can ask pastor for Hershey's kisses. That's the exception to it. Uh, that's one of the one of the delights in pastoring is being able to fill those roles of rotting children's teeth. Uh, it's part, you know, there's the the pastoring with joy and pastoring with grief. You know, and it's the grief to the parents that makes the joy. That doesn't have anything to do with anything, does it? Uh, on another note that has nothing to do with anything, is everybody cool enough this evening? Everybody okay? Comfortable? Okay, I just turned down that AC just a little bit over there because I'm hot right now. It's a little hot up here. But I think it's because of playing basketball with Anthony <laughs> for the service. So, to my shame, I have to admit, Anthony scored on me tonight. And I, and I wasn't letting him. That was the thing. <laughs> Legitimately, legitimately got a rebound, made a shot, didn't you, Anthony? I beat him 11 to 1. And he got one, and I didn't give it to him. So I'm getting old. He's getting older. Here we are, Revelation chapter 20. Looking down to verse 7. The Bible says, And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about, and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. <clears throat> and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. <clears throat> and I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead <coughs> were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Good evening. We're in Revelation 21. There are Bibles available around. Nathan, do you have a Bible? Pass back. So, good to see you. Well, let's pray and let's ask God's blessing on the message this evening. God, this evening, if you were blessed the preaching of your word, you would first of all convince us and show us the nature of the kind of God that you are. God who is supreme, who is all-powerful, who is always in control whose power and whose being has never been in threat or threatened by evil or by evil ones. Yet this evening we recognize as well your mercy, the day and age in which we live, that is a day and age in which we are able to be the recipients of your mercy. God, this evening as well we recognize that you, that you are a God who ultimately is the judge of evil. And Lord, for that part of us that wishes for evil to be judged, I pray that you would help us to do so or to think so in terms or in context of having been made righteous and having 
uh, ourselves being innocent of evil because of your righteousness, but God, not because of our pride. We're not because of looking at someone else as though they were worse than we are. God, I pray as well that you would help us this evening, bless us by helping us to understand just the order of events so that we can live our lives now on the basis of what you're going to do in the future. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Friend, it's a wonderful thing to know Jesus as your Savior. There are all kinds of reasons why it is. But the promise of our future and eternal security are the greatest, uh, some of the greatest benefits of the Christian life. And the reality of it is, is that knowing the future is something that really gives us an advantage in living this life. Isn't it true? If you know what the outcome is going to be, then you really know uh, the right place to be in for the outcome. Uh, every gambler would like to know the outcome, wouldn't they? Anybody who gambles? Uh, I'm, I'm not endorsing gambling. I'm against gambling. The Bible's against gambling. But every gambler would like to know the outcome of the thing that they're gambling on. Or, wouldn't they? Uh, right now they're in the finals in basketball. And there are a lot of people that would like to know the ultimate outcome, especially if it were a surprising outcome, if things didn't happen the way that people think. In other words, if uh, the Warriors and the, and the Cavaliers weren't the final two teams to meet, and if whichever one is the favorite, I'm not sure at the moment, uh, were to you know, be beaten by the other or somebody altogether were to come up and, and beat both of them or uh, whatever the case would be. If you knew that, you could take advantage. In other words, you could align yourself with the outcome in a way that would be advantageous. Our life is not a gamble by any means. But the truth of the matter is, is that we do have the revelation. We have the end of everything and the outcome of evil, the outcome of the world, the outcome of uh, God and Satan and Satan's rebellion against God, the outcome of the rebellion of man. We have the future events recorded for us in the Scripture. Why is it that God gives us that? Why is it necessary for us to know what's going to happen in the future? Throw up, give me some reasons. Why would God tell us what's going to happen in the future? Yes, Josiah? Yes. So we can be prepared. So we can know how to live today. That's exactly right. God gives us the future, not so we can glamorize or glorify the future. I, I so often will turn to Matthew chapter 24. Let's do that real quick. I just want to do this for fun this evening. I, I go to Matthew chapter 24, and uh, you know you really need, if you're going to read it in context, you want to start reading at least in chapter 22. But in Matthew chapter 24, uh, the Bible says that Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Verse 3, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Okay, do you see the questions there? There's three questions, right? When shall these things be? And then there's another question. What shall be the sign of thy coming? And then the third question, what's the sign of the end of the world? There's three different events that Jesus is asked the questions of. Let's look at verse 4. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. This is a verse of the Scripture that I scream at the television screen. I don't really, because I don't really watch the television screen that much. But you know what I'm talking about when, you know, a, a major event happens, like... For instance, a, a runway or a, a, a landing strip in Syria has like 50-something Tomahawk missiles aimed at it. And so then you go on the religious channel on television, I don't know if it's TBN or with the different ones that they have, and you have uh, people that are into Bible prophecy, and they're asked the question, what does this mean? Are we going to go to war with Syria? And is this going to usher in the end times, the apocalyptic events of Ezekiel and of Daniel and of the Revelation? And my answer to the question is Jesus' answer to the question, Matthew 24 and verse 6. Ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. 
Now, what century was it that Jesus said that they would hear wars and rumors of wars? First century. And were there wars and rumors of wars in the first century? Yes. What about the second century? Third century? Fourth century? Fifth century? Sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth? You know, folks, there have always been wars and rumors of wars. And Jesus said, don't be bothered by the rumor, wars and rumors of wars. It is not man in the events of mankind that move heaven and bring God's wrath to a place where it is going to be full. God is the one who is in control of those events. And the events of the world, my friend, have nothing to do with the answers to the three questions that are asked. When shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? But God answers those questions for us actually in Revelation chapter 20. So let's go right back there. And all of Revelation does answer the question. Josiah answered my first question this evening, which is, what is the advantage of knowing the future? And the advantage of knowing the future is that we prepare for it. We begin to live in light of the future now, today. Now, we are at a place, and actually, when you compare the volume of material in Revelation, uh, as, as I was preparing and studying for this message in this past week, I just thought, boy, there isn't very much said about the millennial reign of Christ. I know there's a lot in the Old Testament that refers to that time period and refers to the events where God is working through Israel and so forth. But in the Revelation, you have a period of seven years, the times and, and half a time at a time. Uh, you have the measures of seven years in Revelation. And truthfully, from chapter 4 all the way until chapter 20, that seven years takes up the majority of the volume of the material in Revelation. And so it's really amazing. I mean, you, God summarizes a period of a thousand years. Well, I have a couple thoughts about that just to share with you uh, that I think are a little helpful. Here we are in the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. We are in the period, we know that some of the distinctive uh, things that happen in that period is that God has dealt with rebellion. God has taken the devil, he's taken the beast, the dragon. He has uh, cast the old serpent. That's Those are the words, the dragon, the serpent, the devil. And he has bound him for a thousand years and put him in a bottomless pit. That bottomless pit, my friend, is not the lake of fire. It's not hell. It's a bottomless pit. So I don't, you say, where's the bottomless pit? God could answer that question if he wanted to. But there are plenty of pits that are bottomless, I'm sure, that God has reserved for the devil. And there's one in particular. Okay, so I don't know the place where he's going to be, but he's not going to be allowed to do what he does on earth. I mentioned a couple of weeks ago that we should, should not overestimate or give place to the devil. We shouldn't make too much of the devil. But the devil is responsible for a lot of evil on this earth, isn't it so? It was the serpent who beguiled Eve. He's the, he's the one who's responsible for the evil on this earth. And so it's going to be something to live on a earth that has <laughs> been previously sin-cursed, but having the devil taken off of it. Who is going to be on the earth? Who is going to be part of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ? Well, we will be, actually. There are going to, there are going to be dead that, are, that die during the millennial reign, and they won't be raised up until that time period. But there will be people uh, who are born during that age, during that millennium. And I guess one of the things that's most notable in our text this evening is when... The Bible says in verse 7, When the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth. Okay, humorous note here. Not necessarily to do with our text, but if somebody could tweet or text or email Kyrie Irving and Shaquille O'Neal and just let them know the earth is not flat, it is square. Uh, on the basis of the four quarters of the earth here. Boy, that went right over the top. Some people are like, what? Kyrie Irving... I don't know if he really believes it or not, but he believes the earth, says he believes that the earth is flat, and we've all been fed a bunch of lies about the earth being round, and there, you know, he believes that there's no outer space, you know, they haven't really gone to outer space, it's all just uh, conspiracy and pretend and that sort of thing. And Shaquille O'Neal says that he believes the same thing, and I don't know, I can't tell if they're joking or not about it, but <laughs> the reality of it is, it's just for fun. Uh, the four corners of the earth, my friend, are not a reference to the earth being a square, uh, the four corners of the earth are a reference to the north, south, east, and west. And we recognize that 
that those are legitimately circ a circumference <laughs> because the Bible says as far as the east is from the west. The Bible talks about the circle of the earth and so forth. So we know the earth is round. I'm making jokes about it. And this, this is not a passage of scripture where the Bible is contradicting itself and claiming the earth is not hemispheric, all it is actually square. Not at all, but I thought I'd throw in a joke there for the fun of it. Okay, so from the four corners of the earth, the idea is out of the east, out of the west, out of the north, and out of the south, the devil is going to be everywhere deceiving who? Everywhere deceiving everyone. What's surprising to me, the Bible says, is that in verse 8, it says, to gather them together to battle the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. <laughs> what is surprising to me is <clears throat> the number of individuals who choose to be deceived. And I chose those words carefully. Choose to be deceived is fully accurate. The reality of it, my friend, is that self-deception or deception or the allow, allowing yourself to be deceived by somebody is on purpose. You ever believed what you wanted to believe? I used to work in a mechanic shop and a lot of people believe what they want to about their cars. Uh, I remember uh, having some people come in and you know you hate giving somebody a bad diagnosis for their vehicle and honestly it's a good thing I'm a pastor because when somebody comes in you know their engine is really and they've got something catastrophic to where they need a new engine I want to just replace the engine for them, you know. I just want, you know, because it's really costly, and you can just, I can feel people's pain, you know, when you tell them the truth. Well, you know, it overheated, but it didn't just overheat; it overheated so badly that it spun a bearing, and now it's knocking. The reason it's knocking is that there's irreparable damage uh, to the crankshaft, and the crankshaft's too major to do without rebuilding your whole engine. You need a new engine. I've had that sort of a diagnosis before and then had the people, you know, take it to a shop where they say, well, put some real thick oil in it. And, um, you know, I mean, maybe, you know, if you change the oil, it'll fix it. Uh, we used to have in our, in the shop I worked in when it was brand new transmission flushes. I know we got a really cool machine. It would basically, you hook it up, you, you disconnect the, this, I know this isn't terribly interesting most of you, you disconnect the transmission lines and you hook it up to the machine and you pour like gallons of transmission fluid in it and what it does is it pumps out the old transmission fluid and it keeps pumping new in until the, the fluid in your transmission looks like it's just absolutely spotless. No burnt material, no clutches or anything like that in it. And that's pretty neat I guess to have really clean transmission fluid. Transmission techs tell me and I think it's true that clean transmission fluid doesn't necessarily work any better than dirty transmission fluid. If you've got a problem, you've got a problem. It's a hard problem mechanical problem and I've never seen flushing or changing transmission fluid fix anything doesn't because something's broken by the time it's not working or functioning correctly but I don't know how many people would come into the shop and they would say we want a transmission flush and I learned to say are you having trouble with your transmission because a transmission flush is fine for a transmission that has no issues but if you have issues with your transmission changing your transmission fluid won't change anything and I know other shops and other techs would say, well, we'll try and change the transmission fluid. I knew, well, it's going to cost them 180 bucks, but it's not going to fix anything because you've got something that's broken. Sometimes we believe what we want to believe, right? So people would pull their car, they say, well, I'm going to go to another shop and get a second opinion. And then we go get a second opinion from somebody that told them what they wanted to hear. Did it have anything to do with the facts? Well, hard parts broken are hard parts broken. And that's just the fact. I do the same thing all the time. I always hope that things are better than they are. I'm an eternal, eternally optimistic person. I always hope things aren't as bad as they seem. And so I'll deceive myself. I'll believe the best when it's actually the worst. And it isn't because I can't see the facts. It's because I believe what I want to. We're all capable of self-deception. But think of the logic with me, if you will follow now. Think of the logic of someone who understands and knows world history. This millennial reign of Christ, will someone describe uh, ethnically what kind of a reign it is? Somebody help me with it? Jewish. 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 Okay. Will it be a dictatorship, an oligarchy, a monarchy? What kind of a reign is it? A what? A monarchy the king. 
in the millennial reign? Jesus. Jesus. And he'll have, David will certainly have a role as king in, in the millennial reign as well. You see that he's promised that, that he's, and it, whether, whether it'll be Christ on the throne of David as a representative of David. But Jesus will be the one who's reigning in the millennium. <coughs> Will people in the millennial reign be ignorant of world history? Not in your life. The fact of the matter is everyone will know that there was a devil and that he's bound, chained, in a bottomless pit. And everyone will know that Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. And so when we look at the deception here, remind yourself and let us remind uh, each other and others that deception is deliberate, it's on purpose. It is not that people don't know who God is, who Jesus is, and what has happened in the past on this earth. And yet the devil is able to go to the four corners of the earth and literally deceive. The Bible describes the multitudes as the sand of the seashore. That is ridiculous, isn't it? And it's so typical of rebellion. Rebellion is willful. You say, well, it's the devil's fault. I mean, he's so powerful. My friend, do you think the rebellion didn't exist before the devil rallied the troops? You think the people just didn't know who Jesus was? Not in your life. You and I must take rebellion very seriously. If we haven't learned anything in our series in Revelation, we ought to learn that rebellion, when it, when it rears its ugly head up in me, is a big deal. It's a major problem. Rebellion is probably the most easily learned attitude there is. Mm. Try it. Don't try it, but think of it. Will you please? You ever taught, anyone ever, ever taught school or substitute taught school? When you have a kid that disrespects his teachers, where do you learn it? Parents. From his parents. <laughs> I hate to say it, but I see it in homes all the time. Husband will come to me and say, my wife doesn't listen to me. She doesn't respect me. My children don't respect me. No one in my home does anything I say or cares what I say. And I watch the same person that says that to me do the same thing to his pastor that his kids do to him. Do the same thing to his boss that his kids do to him. And it's surprising to me sometimes that his problem is nobody respects me, but he doesn't respect anyone. Small wonder his children learned that. Rebellion is the most easily taught attitude there is. Parents, be extremely careful with authority. Every person who's under authority ought to be very, very careful about how they handle even their authority's missteps. Is there any perfect authority? There isn't. God is. God's our only perfect authority, but humanly speaking, there is no perfect authority. So every single one of us ought to very, very carefully reevaluate. Well, I have to all the time. Man, I find myself being rebellious. It's, it's in us, isn't it? I find myself resenting authority. And when I do so, my friend, it's very, very dangerous because I teach it to others. I teach others the same thing. And so... This matter of rebellion, Satan didn't come and invent something and lead innocent people. He led individuals who were susceptible, and they were susceptible because they were ready to rebel against God. The Bible says in verse 9, they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about the beloved city. And this has got to be one of the shortest descriptions of final terrible judgment. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Really not much of a battle. If they dialed back a thousand years, it might have helped them a little bit when they saw that the nations came out to rebel against God, the kings of the earth. and Literally, Christ came and He spoke their destruction. And friend... Revelation has over and over and over and over again emphasized the finality and the suddenness of God's judgment. And yet there are still people that would 
respond to God's judgment as though it does not affect them individually. You've heard this, haven't you? I could never worship a God like that. If that is not the most ridiculous response to authority, in other words, if that's the way God is, I reject Him. That's most people's response to God's final hand of judgment. What is that? That's rebellion. That's, I will not bend, I will not bow to anyone, far less God. And friend, the cause of that attitude is that we think too little of God and too much of ourselves. We think too little of God and too much of ourselves. This has been this glorious, beautiful, thousand-year reign of Christ. We see a little bit of a description as well. I, I, I didn't want to pass over. We see a, a description of... Um, in verse 9 of the location. The Bible says they compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. What's the beloved city? It's Jerusalem. Now, it's really interesting because understand on the basis of the judgments that we've seen during the tribulation, those judgments have literally changed the makeup and the face of the earth. And so things are very different, but Jerusalem is still in its location. And the world literally comes there. And so I will say to you that Jerusalem has been and always will be a significant place of world events. Let me offer you some interesting encouragement here. I never want to be against Israel because God loves Israel. I hope you understand that. I don't, I don't, I'm not under some kind of illusion that Israel is always right or never does wrong or deserves uh, necessarily unconditional approval for everything that she does. Israel has rebelled against God, and I cannot approve of that. But nothing threatens the existence of Israel because God has a future plan for her. I love telling Jewish friends that are afraid that, that Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. I love telling them, Jerusalem cannot be destroyed. God won't allow it. When Jerusalem gets destroyed, God's going to do it. And He's not going to let anyone else do it. I find great comfort in that, actually. And you look at God's people, and you look at how that the nations of the earth literally threaten her on a continuous basis. And yet, in spite of that, God's protection is on that spot of land, and He has a future plan for it. And it's great to know that because I'm able to sleep better at night, truthfully knowing that Israel is not going to be obliterated, Jerusalem isn't going to be wiped off the map, God won't allow it. Isn't that great? It's just, a, just an extra truth, but it is true. Well, then the Bible says, after fire came down from God out of heaven and it devours all the wicked people, that the Bible says the devil that deceived them was cast in the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. There are people who claim that Death and hell are a one-time event. That is, some people think that dying is hell. They'll use terms like the word Gehenna that we use, really that's described as Gehenna because of hell, that place outside of, of uh, Jerusalem. It's literally where the potter's field was, where uh, when Judas cast down his 30 pieces of silver into the temple and then they went and bought a potter's field. Gehenna's the place there. There are graves there. Now there's a monastery there in that location. But that was the place where the Jews offered their babies to the fire of the gods of Molech. And so it was a place of burning or torment, the word was. But my friend, hell is hell. And the words in Revelation mean what they say about eternal, eternal torment. The Bible says they shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. When I see the reality of hell, I'm always reminded, first of all, the urgency of my salvation, as well as the urgency to preach the gospel to everyone. This past week, I was grieved over internet memes making fun of the death of Aaron Rodriguez. You talk about sick, demented people yes. making fun of the death of a person who is somewhere forever. By the way, he had his Bible open to John 3.16, had John 3.16 underlined, had John 3.16 written on his forehead. And so, you know, I cannot condone somebody killing themselves, but I believe he's in heaven. And boy, am I relieved and glad for him.
Because, friend, when I heard last week, this morning, that he had committed suicide, that was the headline, it literally just crushed me, just grieved my heart, just thought this is absolutely terrible because this man will be somewhere forever. And he's taken lives. He's guilty of murder. And he has destroyed people's lives. But I'll just tell you something. He had a terrible life. He literally grew up in an absolutely terrible environment. And today he's in eternity. And I'm just glad that he knew John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. And friend, if he believed in Jesus, he is in heaven today. But you, you and I need to remember that death and hell, they're forever. But they're not something where you go into the ground and you cease to exist. So many times people take the life that we live that's described sometimes by Solomon, for instance, in Ecclesiastes, and they say, well, you know, we just go into the ground and we cease to exist. No, my friend, everyone has an eternal soul. Matter of fact, we see that in our context this evening. The Bible says uh, in verse 12, uh, well, we've, we see as well in verse 11, I saw a great white throne, him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. Verse 12, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Side note about the book of life. It's interesting that earlier in Revelation, we see the promise that your name will not be blotted out of the book of life. And this is an interesting study that you ought to do as a believer to understand that God wants all men to be saved. Now the Bible does say that God wants all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. The Bible says in uh, 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slack concerning His promises as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us. We're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It's interesting that as you study the book of life, you come to realize that every person who's ever been born has their name written in the book of life. And upon unbelief, has their name blotted out. And that is indicative of the fact that God's plan for every person who's ever been born is that their name would be left, written in the book of life. God did not create someone to go to hell, my friend. God created all men to be reconciled to Himself and gave His Son in order that that could be the case. Any person who goes to hell does so against God's will and does so. You say, Pastor, can someone thwart God's will? My friend, God gives man a will, and giving a man a will is not a threat to his will. And so anyone who does so, anyone who has their name written or taken out of the book of life is someone who said, I don't want my name in that book. You go to hell for rejecting God, my friend. Isn't it a wonderful thing that the Bible says as many as received Him, to them gave He the power to become the sons of God? You know the word believe, my friend. You can play all the games you want to with the word belief, but belief is a volitional word. That is a choice of an individual's will. And believe is not believe if you don't believe, if you're forced to. You can't force belief. It's impossible. It's in, it is a contradictory concept to try to say that a person doesn't believe because they cannot believe or were not allowed to believe or are made not to believe. <coughs> the reality of it is you believe what you want to, because of your will. And God gives people choices. And here we find in the Scripture that the Bible said, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of the life, book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Isn't it tragic that at the great white throne of judgment, people get exactly what they want? Well, how many times I've try to share the gospel with someone and they tell me that they do not need a conversion, quote, experience or to receive Jesus as their Savior or they do not need the cross, they do not need Jesus specifically or the salvation plan that God has offered because of what they do. I don't know how many people have said, I'm going to heaven because I'm a good person. Brother Larry was talking about somebody in Italy they just shared the gospel with and he was saying, that they had told him, hey, listen, I've got look at how many crucifixes I have in my house. I live next door to, to, to nuns. Look at the, the Mary. Look at the picture I have of Pope John Paul. And look at this and this and this and this. And I'm good. I'm covered. My people will be lost by lack of knowledge. Sure. But the question is, how many individuals who trust in their works really want to be judged according to their works? Because this is where it happens. 
This is where people get to be judged according to their works. The great white throne judgment. And God actually judges their works. And the Bible says about that great white throne judgment that they were judged every man according to their works. And then it says death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. Literally, everyone is going to be judged for their works and they're going to be judged. The judgment is going to be unanimous. Same judgment for every person that's involved in this judgment. Guilty. Guilty. The Bible says in verse 14, Death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. If you're lost, my friend, there are two deaths. There are two deaths. There's a physical death that you die, and then there's the final death where you are literally judged into hell and the lake of fire forever and ever and ever. If you're born again, there are no deaths. There's a bodily, physical, temporary separation from your body. But even this physical body that will, quote, die, God's going to raise it up. We're already risen with Christ with regard to our inner man, who we actually are. But the body we live in, though it could die, my friend, will be raised again. There is a second death that no one will escape from who is an unbliever who does not know God. Josiah said in the beginning that the advantage of knowing what's going to happen in the future is that we prepare for it. My friend, how do you prepare for the great white throne judgment? Two ways, right? Make sure you're not going to be there. Make sure other people aren't going to be there. That's how you prepare for a judgment like that. Teach other people the truth about their future. Teach other people the truth about God. Be as kind as you can. Be careful to be true about what you say. I don't know how many times we find ourselves trying to agree with someone that ultimately doesn't agree with God. We try to find in religion things that are close enough in our minds that they're similar. The friend, what every person needs in order to be born again is to look to Jesus Christ as their Savior. Jesus said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. You want eternal life? Life lasts forever? Look to Jesus. Trust Jesus as your Savior. And if you receive Jesus, the Bible says, as many as received Him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God, even as many as believed on His name. Friend, it's pretty easy to believe in Jesus. You simply have to make the choice to reject your rebellion. Put down that part of you that says, no, God, I don't, I don't accept that. I don't accept you. I don't believe. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't. Instead, to say, I believe, Lord, help out my unbelief. And God will do that for you. And I think that a person who understands the future as well as a person is going to be filled with compassion. I have before, and I'm going to finish with this, I have before experienced people that are taking the truth that's in this text and they are corrupting it by misapplying it. I remember when I was in Bible college, a man standing in the street with a sign. He had scripture verses from, from uh, Revelation 20. And I rolled down my window to hear what he was shouting. And he looked at me and he said, You're going to hell. You're going to burn forever in the lake of fire. And he quotes the scriptures. Friend, I'm not going to hell. I'm not going to burn forever in the lake of fire. And I can't really see where that application of this message would keep somebody from going there. I suppose that there are some people that would respond to the shock of it. It would point them to deal with themselves. And I'm glad for anyone that could respond to that kind of a message. But the reality of it is that death and hell and the understanding of how real they are, they're not virtual, they're literal. Understanding how real, how literal they are ought to make us literally grieve and be filled with compassion for the lost. It ought to make us not care about ourselves and how we're received. It's amazing how wounded and offended we can be when somebody doesn't want to hear something that's an important message. If I'll just tell you something, it doesn't really matter how people receive me. I need to get them the message. Sometimes I, we were so prideful in how we shared, like, well, if you're real nice to me, I'll tell you how to get to heaven. 
my friend, y'all don't need somebody to be nice to me. Matter of fact, if someone rejects me when I try to preach the gospel to them, if I have a chance, I need to just go back at them again. Not because I'm trying to win an argument or I'm trying to uh, get some, put someone in their place. I need to go back at it again because they still need to be saved. It's amazing how one time, two times, three times, four times, eventually somebody sharing the gospel with compassion will win a person who doesn't want to think about the most important matter they can deal with, that is their eternal destiny. We need to be compassionate to the lost. Let's preach it. Let's look at the future events and what God is going to do, and let's preach the Word of God, and let's pray to them. We'll see souls come to Jesus. Father, thank you so much for what you taught us from your Word this evening. I pray that you would help us not to misapply it, but to apply it compassionately. First of all, by knowing that our eternal destiny is settled, that we're on our way to heaven. Second, Father, by recognizing not only are we on our way to heaven, but it's so important to make sure that those that we come into contact with, not only the people that are near us, our friends and our family and our neighbors, but God, those who live around us, that they hear the truth. And God, that they know that they can have eternal life. We pray that you would help us with this truth, that we would be ones who would be able to testify the blessing of reading this book and studying it and obeying it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. Thanks for your good attention tonight. You're dismissed. Yes, you have something? Yes.